I see that we, we've got quite a few folks in here now, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, thank you so much to Jason for posting um, some of our reminders that we have at the beginning of every community call. Um, first of all, this meeting is recorded. Um, if you do not want to participate in the recording, please go ahead and leave the call now. Um, the recording will be posted to our community call YouTube channel, which is linked here. Um, we try and post these calls as soon as we can, uh, but we kind of guarantee you within a two week time span, usually it happens much sooner than that. Um, please also remember that we take our code of conduct very seriously. If you aren't familiar with the code of conduct, it's linked there. Um, but really the key point is, you know, treating each other with kindness and all those sorts of things. Um, we also do have a discussion link. Um, it's in the PowerShell PowerShell repo in the discussions portion. Um, we post the discussion before each community call with the agenda. Um, and this is a place where you can post um, in advance of the call any topics you want to discuss, any demos you might want to have, any questions you have, anything like that. Um, and also during the call, you can continue to post there as well. If you'd like to kind of interactively participate in the call, that is totally welcome. Um, please feel free to use the chat or use the raise hand feature if you have any questions, comments, feedback throughout. Um, with that, we can go ahead and get started with the agenda for today. First up, we have Damien, who's going to be talking about PSConf EU, which is happening next week. <clears throat> hey, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just joining. Um, so yeah, next week I'll be in Anvert in Belgium, um, lovely Belgium, uh, with a few folks from the team. I, I'll get to that in a minute to talk about a um, few things that we've been working on. <laughs> Actually, pretty much everything we've been working on in the last year. Uh, if you haven't looked at the agenda, and if you're coming to PSConf EU, which uh, I would very welcome uh, talking with each of you, have some, spending some time chatting about different areas. Um, but we have uh, seven sessions, if I count correctly, around AI in the shell. Uh, we're going to talk about container and galleries. We're going to talk about the CV3, machine config, Winget, Azure Client Tool, Azure CLI, Azure PowerShell. Uh, and we're also going to talk about Azure Arc and PowerShell for remote connectivity. Um, part of the crew who is going to be there, uh, we have Steve, Amber, I don't know if you're in the call, uh, with Mewa, uh, Demetrius, Arnov, um, and myself. <laughs> uh, we are, may have one of my team members from Shanghai, uh, he's waiting on his visa, so Fingers crossed. Um, but other than that, um, I think that's the whole crew that's going to be in uh, Anvert next week. So whoever is there, uh, looking forward to seeing you. Awesome. Yeah, it's going to be a really great conference. And certainly if you are there um, in Antwerp next week, please reach out to any of the Microsoft folks um, who are in attendance. They're really there to speak with you. Um, and talk with you. So go up and say hi. Um, next up, we have Michael, who's going to talk a little bit about a uh, collaboration that um, around DSC and Winget. Yeah, this has been awesome. And there's going to be a session on it at PS EU. So to tie those that last topic to this one, um, Demetrius from Winget is coming over and is going to be talking about this scenario. But uh, I just dropped the link in the chat. There was an awesome session uh, at the Build conference not too long ago that highlighted a whole new set of scenarios for DSC. So if you've used DSC in the past, you've seen, you know, probably in Windows where local configuration manager was running as local system and it was really focused on servers. And the idea was, you know, this is an agent type scenario. It's built into Windows, not really an agent, but, um, you know, with machine config, we're operating as an extension. Might want to call that one an agent, I guess. But the whole premise was it's running as local system and it's focusing on operating system settings and turning on features, configuring IIS. One of the things people have talked about for a long, long time now for DSC is could you run it as a user to configure your user environment? 
it's been kind of like, you know, we sort of ho-hum around, well, we don't know how many people want to do that, you know, who, how many people want to do configuration as code for user settings, things like that. Well, it turns out uh, that this DevBox team that works in uh, at, at Microsoft in Azure um, is really interested in the scenario where if you're going to provision a bunch of virtual desktops for developers to align to a project, it's really appetizing to be able to make all those machines look the same. Uh, so the person in charge of the project, uh, the idea is they would just define, I want them to have VS Code, I want these extensions in VS Code, I want these settings in Windows, I want them to all have the same desktop background, you know, like all this kind of stuff. And to be able to define that with your project, and then as you spin up a developer environment, uh, actually configure the user environment, not just the operating system environment. So you'll see that. Uh, if you go watch that video, it's the, the, the DSC section starts at 2125. And, and I'll just sort of say, you know, this is one of those scenarios where they call it out as DSC. I think we're maturing to the point where it's like, do we really need them to even say the words DSC, right? Like the functionality that gets delivered here seems like magic to an end user. And uh, it's really exciting. And, and actually there's some really cool accessibility scenarios here where we can just say, you know, you're, you don't have uh, uh, the ability to see a screen. So how do you turn on, you know, narrator, that kind of thinking. Um, Turns out those scenarios work really well for these for, for, for DSC running as a user uh, because you could sort of like profile what you need your machine to look like. So this is a whole new area of exploration, but we're super excited about it. Uh, and I hope you go take a look at that video because I got really, really excited whenever I watched it. So thanks. Hey, Sydney, let okay. me add on something real yeah. quick related yeah, to DSC. So I had just published uh, DC V3 Preview 8 yesterday, I believe. And I'm in process of trying to get it published to the Microsoft Store to make it a little bit easier to install. Uh, so look forward to that. Um, that's it. Great. Um, James, did you have something you want to say around that? Yeah, sorry. I just uh, had some crowd and raising problems. Um, so for DSC, it would be great to have it run in the user space. Accessibility would possibly be very legally huge. Because if you have somebody who has accessibility requirements like vision requirements, this can become like, well, a lawsuit waiting to happen if you're not giving them a box that's already provisioned with that in mind. Um, so those two are critically important. Uh, the other one is, uh, Michael said, hey, do we even need to say DSC anymore? Yes, yes, please say DSC because it's one of the ways that PowerShell will kind of worm its way back into a lot of other ecosystems. So I think that it's really critically important that especially as PowerShell underlies how you configure Windows and PowerShell underlies how you configure Docker, that we keep mentioning PowerShell and that we keep mentioning DSC. So that's that's my messaging two cents. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, James. And um, you. I can see the comment. Um, Demetrius would love to connect with you around the accessibility compli compliance uh, comment you're saying. Um, going, moving along with our agenda, um, our next topic was um, a build recap. Um, I was lucky enough to get to attend build, and I got to see James there actually. Um, I was actually there helping staff um, the Linux booth, which was a total learning experience. Um, for me, but I really got to think um, about how PowerShell fits into the Linux ecosystem and also connect with a number of folks around PowerShell scenarios. Took the liberty of bringing the wonderful um, PowerShell signs that some of you have given us um, and 3D printed for us and put them up on the Linux booth. So that was a lot of fun to get to connect with different PowerShell users um, at Build and hear about uh, what you all are doing with PowerShell these days. I think a, a really huge theme of build was around co-pilot and AI type scenarios. Um, so if you have any, if anyone has any feedback around build or um, you know things that they might have heard there or seen, um, if they got to watch sessions, would love to hear more about that. Um, was also able to attend the MVP event there, which was a really great way to connect with more uh, PowerShell folks as well. Um, we are really looking forward to figuring out plans around Ignite. Um, so if you have topics you'd love to see us cover or are really interested in um, around Ignite plans too, we'd love to hear that as well. 
And with that, I will pass it on to Aditya, who is going to talk about the PowerShell second releases. Hello, everyone. I have a quick update. We had uh, security update releases for 7.2 and 7.4 earlier this week. So give them a try uh, and give us feedback if you find anything. Uh, I would like to remind everyone that 7.2 would be going uh, end of life uh, later this year in November. So I would highly recommend everyone to move on to 7.4 uh, and start planning for it. That's it. Awesome. Thank you for that. And just a reminder that we did do a 7.5 preview release last month in May. We covered that one in the May community call. Um, so if you had questions about that, still happy to answer them in this call. Uh, you can also look back to last month's call when we covered that one in a little bit more depth. Um, yeah, thanks for the team for getting out the 7.2 and 7.4 releases as well. Let me go back to the agenda. And I have another agenda item. Uh, yes. Um, so you may see in some of the repos that there are PRs going up um, and getting merged around code of conduct updates. Um, so I just wanted to call this out in case folks are seeing this and kind of wondering what's going on here. Um, we are still following the Microsoft open source code of conduct. So and not a lot of the language around the actual code of conduct has really changed. Um, the big change here um, is really around some of the resources that are being provided to Microsoft employees around support and reporting for code of conduct violations. Um, and so that is the change that's kind of being put in. However, um, I think it's always a good time to sort of remind folks of the code of conduct and to just refresh yourself with it if you haven't read it before. Um, I know you are all wonderful people and are great at following our code of conduct, but I'll just paste it in the chat again if you just need a refresher or want to read it. Um, and if you are having any issues with it, um, do report it and please let us know. Next up, I believe we have Doc's update from Sean. All right, let me share my screen. Um, as far as new content goes, uh, we have um, one new article that I want to talk about. Um, uh, Tab expansion two, we have always documented here in the list of built-in functions, but we don't say much about it. Now there is uh, full documentation here with some examples. Um, normally this is, isn't a function that you use interactively, but it can be useful in test scenarios. Um, like if you wanna create pester tests to test that uh, your tab expansion uh, argument completion, things like that is working properly. So that's what this uh, article covers. Um, also in support of the recent releases, we've updated um, the uh, documentation for uh, the release notes. Um, in the last month we had uh, a new preview, preview three of PowerShell 7.5, and you can see what's there. And uh, as Aditya said, we had updates for 7.2 and 7.4. Um, the one notable change in 7.4 is um, now the tilde it, on Windows, um, the tilde is tab expanded to your home directory. Um, so if you're using Tilly with uh, native commands, like Notepad, for example, um, and you hit tab, it will be expanded so that um, uh, it will work properly with the native command. And uh, also there's, uh, as Steve said, a new version of DSC preview that was released. Mikey's working on doc ups dates for that. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Mike Robbins. He's going to talk about some changes um, in the Azure PowerShell space real quick. 
So yeah, we had a new version of the AZ PowerShell module release at Build, version 12. I'm going to share my screen real quick for the doc updates. So uh, the highlights, you can just go out to what's new in Azure PowerShell in our documentation, the overview. And these first four items are kind of the highlights. Uh, there's a protect sensitive information warning that will be displayed if secrets are displayed in any output, and that is enabled by default with AZ-12. It was pre previously available, but just not enabled by default. Also, uh, if you're running Windows 10 or Windows Server 2019 or higher, um, sign in with WAM with Web Account Manager is enabled by default. And we have a new login experience. And we have a new support lifecycle. So now we're shipping STS and LTS versions. Um, and this article is actually completely rewritten. And it's the combination of two different articles. So let me go to the um, interactive logon article. And the links in the, uh, in the overview of what's new would take you, take you to the same place. But this goes through detailed steps of what the new logon experience works works like. And if you'd like to disable the new logon experience, you can also do that. If you don't want to be prompted every time you log into Azure PowerShell, you can set a default subscription as well. Um, some benefits of WAM, limitations of WAM, and then also how to disable WAM. And if you happen to run into any issues with the new features, there's a couple of sections in the troubleshooting doc. So there's a scenario where there's informational messages that are outputted to the information stream and not the success stream. But if you, depending on a third party automated solution you might be using, those messages could end up in causing issues and you can log in and ignore the information stream as a temporary workaround. Um, and these are the documented issues with a web account manager, and you can also disable WAM to, to work around those. One thing I would recommend, so we have a release notes article. I'd recommend taking a look at the release notes uh, before updating to AZ-12. And then also we have a migration guide. So it'll give you detailed steps of how things worked before and how they worked afterwards. And I think that's it for the doc updates. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I did see one question, I think related to some of this um, from Missy. It says, with AZ PowerShell, um, what parameters would you recommend to use for Connect AZ account if you need to alt need an alternate credential that has MFA enabled? Okay, and I know we've got Damien, uh, one of the PMs for Azure PowerShell on the call. So, uh, so I'll defer that to Damien to get the official answer. Sure. I don't know if there is an official answer here, uh, but okay. more if you're using um, <clears throat> if you're using MFA, it likely means you're going to use interactive authentication. Uh, otherwise, your script and automation script could be uh, broken. So. Uh, connect AZ account without any parameters uh, will route you through uh, the flow that will support MFA. If you're trying to use username and password, uh, passing the credential, like connect AZ account dash credentials and pass the PS credential object, that flow is going to break once you have MFA enabled. Uh, so my recommendation would be to not use any, <clears throat> any parameter with connect AZ account unless except the subscription ID or tenant ID, those would be fine. But anything that force a certain flow of authentication um, that is not the default one is, is likely going to have uh, challenges with MFA. Okay, thank you. We'll give that a try. Good. I know it was a longer ex explanation. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I'm, I'm watching the chat and I'm seeing a lot of questions getting answered in chat. But if anyone's question hasn't gotten answered, um, please feel free to raise your hand or kind of re. Um, okay, Thomas has a question. Um, and the PowerShell team roadmap for 2024, there was a mention of the team's focus on community PRs. Now that we're halfway into the year, do we have metrics on how many community PRs were reviewed slash merged? 
versus last year to see how this initiative is going. You want me to take this one? Yeah, if you want. So to I don't, it. I don't have any metrics. I don't know if uh, Dombo is here. I don't think he has metrics, but he might be able to collect them. Uh, maybe we can talk more about that and have data next community call. Um, again, one thing I'll, I'll um, emphasize, like what we initially set out for 2024 and where we are today, uh, there has been some impact and changes due to a large, uh, large focus on the team for some security changes. Not security in terms of security issues in PowerShell itself, but really securing our infrastructure and, and our supply chain. Um, so these are things that are on the back end in our infrastructure that you don't actually see in the code at all. Um, one of the questions that came up is like, you know, it's on the daily builds. Yeah, that's currently broken because of these changes. I don't know when that's going to come back. Um, but that also because of that focus that also has kind of a limited, uh, unfortunately, some of our ability to kind of review some of the community PRs. Uh, I'm hoping that we can refocus our Monday community days to kind of bring some of those in. I know that we've gotten a number of those merged in, uh, but I don't have those numbers on top of my head right now. So. Thanks. By the way, I'll just put a call out like it would also help us if uh, rather than necessarily uh, contributing a new PR to have community folks review existing PRs, um, that would be very helpful. Thanks. Can I actually just do a shameless plug for the uh, community overall? And, Absolutely, uh, please do. Yeah, so I posted into chat about um, uh, the PowerShell Saturday that the uh, Research Triangle PowerShell user group is going to host. Um, call for speakers is currently up and available. This is an event that we want to lead by the community. This is a PowerShell um, focused event, but primarily it's a community based event. So this will be a Saturday running in October, October 5th and 6th. We'll actually do a second day if uh, we have good, good enough uh, requests for it at that point. So it is currently going to be hosted into the Raleigh Triangle area, North Carolina. And uh, call for speakers is out there. We want to get the community involved, and we want to, you know, to do this. Shameless plug for the Research Triangle PowerShell user group as well, in that we meet twice a month, and the uh, involvement there has just been a a great one. And uh, people do a great job presenting. I do. I didn't have enough opportunity to do a demo this time, but I want to do one next time of the after hours, as we call them. And so, well, we have meetings all the time, but. Quite often, it's it's the before meetings and the after meetings where people just open up and have conversation. And we had a really good one last one, a good one last time, talking about you know parameter parallelization of uh, commands. And so um, I want to kind of demo that and go through that and and work through the idea of just the community sharing with the community. And that's just been what I you know really offer. So I just want to say thank you, shameless plug for the Research Triangle PowerShell user group and a shameless plug for the um, PowerShell Saturday coming up in October. Thanks. Yes, thank you so much, Phil. And anyone who is putting on PowerShell events, PowerShell user groups, you are always more than welcome to promote them here. We really love to see that. Um, I saw that um, Sean is also posted about um, SQL Saturday at Baton Rouge, um, which is coming up in July and it has a small PowerShell. Um, track. I, I don't know if you answered this. Uh, oh yeah, it looks like you did. Um, about some. Uh, sorry, about if you're accepting some remote sessions. Um, that is great. I'm just reading the chat. Cool. Some people are going to be in Baton Rouge. Um, looks like a few folks are up for some PowerShell GUI stuff. Can we keep it to like under 10 minutes, James? uh sure maybe hopefully probably uh darren do you have something you wanted to talk about because your, your camera is on you want to go first oh man uh no it'll just be a rehash of the thing i showed last time I'm still hammering that out but i'm i'm pretty much at the finish line now yeah mine's more going to be uh let's hope the demo gods aren't cruel to me work in progress so um a funny thing happened along the way to the forum. You guys know I've been messing around with PowerShell and GUI a while now. Uh, I was looking for a thing to go render a 3D shape uh, just because I wanted to, and I found a really, really nice platform for being able to do lots of stuff in 3D. And then I set about wrapping it in PowerShell. So let's see, demo gods, how nice are you? 
we got a lot of parameters here, but we're basically just calling show PSSVG, which is a list show SVG, giving it a randomized rows with a bunch of morphs, picking a random color palette, picking a random number of copies for 2D and 3D, setting it in 3D, picking up to 512 random copies, and popping it out into a file. I'm going to call it T8. Now, I have no control over how good or bad this one might look. But, you know, could it come out worse? Uh, this is a few hundred objects rendering in a 3D table, in a bubble, in a sphere, in a helix, in a cube, and in just random space if you really think that's helpful. Any of these are clickable, can, can contain anything. So to kind of half prove the point here, I'm going to take another quick demo that I ran here, which is just taking some trending images from Giphy and throwing them into a 25 by 25 grid. Hey, James, do that real I don't want to interrupt you, but I just made you a presenter because on my screen, you're just showing it in a tiny box. Can you try right. re-presenting yep. or re-sharing? There you go. Okay, yeah, now it works. Cool. Uh, give me a second to let it kind of catch up. Okay, so we're doing the 25 or they x 25 copies of the trending uh, Giphy's. We'll have some repeats in a 25 by 25 grid. Not 3D yet. We'll make it 3D in a quick second. So let's go ahead and say Giphy 25. There we go. Cool. Yay, 2D grids too. Let's make that in 3D and give it a 3D copy count. Uh, anybody want to pick something? Let's let's go for 256 or right, right at the PowerShell way, 0.25 KB. Okay. Uh, demo gods being cruel here. Yes, just a little bit. That's on me. There we go. And now we have all those nice animated GIFs in 2D or 3D space on a randomized color scheme. Again, anything can be in here. And these are indeed clickable. So if I just go ahead and I guess we're a day late for that one here. So let's go click this. Oh, we are. So yeah, um, that's going to be fun and interesting. The long story made short of all of this is we're about to be able to take everything that we did in PowerShell including formatters and types, bring them over into the web in 2D and 3D, and it's going to be awesome. And I'm done now. Less than 10 minutes, right? Yep, you got it. Perfect. All righty. Well, so one to ten, 10 coolness factor, just like having just absorbed this as a group. Because this is, I didn't set out to do this like starting off last month. Uh, I just kind of found myself there, but I'm enjoying where I found myself. What do you all think of this? Does this have cool potential? Feel free to respond to James in the chat. <laughs> um, uh, Yes, this would also be great for generating here's the team images or family trees or, you know, personal media collections or about anything. Uh, there was an old talk going around Microsoft around the time of Windows 8 talking about familiar versus modern GUI. The idea being that when modern GUI shows up, people will just magically start using it because it'll be so much better. And I think this is a good talking point, but didn't exactly fit for Win 8. Uh, one of the things that I'm realizing very rapidly in this is that this can change the whole way we interact with everything because the screen density is so much bigger. Because by being able to take our 1920 by 1080 screens and project them in a third dimension, we can actually have hundreds or thousands of content items on the screen without getting as overwhelmed. Uh, so I think this could actually change quite a lot and while i didn't expect to find myself there i'm really looking forward to where this takes us uh related side note of understanding a types ps1 xml or a format ps1 xml can indeed live in a web page as metadata and be used 
So it is actually not as bad as it might seem to take PowerShell and bridge it into web languages with all of our bells and whistles intact. Just going to take a little bit more work. Famous last words as those always are. Awesome. Um, well, thank you, James. Thank you for the demo. Um, I think I'm going to cut off the community call here if there are any more questions and give everyone a wonderful 30 minutes back. Um, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much for joining our call today. Um, and feel free to put any more questions or things we didn't answer in the chat.